Uh, the hour being uh, 6 p.m. on Monday, May 9th, 2022, I'd like to call to order uh, the City of Laconia City Council budget meeting. Uh, we are joined um, at council table this evening by uh, Katie Gargano, as well as uh, with, um, we're also joined by um, Scott Myers and Glenn Smith. Before we go any further though, I'd ask the uh, clerk, Katie, Ms. Gargano to call the roll, please. Here. Here. Councilor Lipton. Present. Councilor Haynes. Here. Councilor Hamill. Present. Councilor Kraut. Here. Here. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us at this early hour this evening. And uh, on number five on our uh, agenda this evening is uh, under presentations, 5A is the school district. And I see Superintendent Tucker here with a, some, um, some staff. So please step forward and love to have your presentation. Mr. Mayor, if I could, just for a procedural for the record, where Councillor Susi is remote, there's two questions we need to ask him. Was it not reasonably practical for him to be here this evening? And is anybody else with him where he is? Okay, I'm away on business. I'm actually in Prattville, Alabama. I'm in a hotel room alone by myself. Perfect. Sounds like we're good to go now. <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that. No, oh, wow. that's good living, Councilor Susie. <laughs> Come right up. Come right up. School board chair Hayward has joined you as well. Terrific. So well, just on behalf of the board, I uh, certainly want to thank you for your time. Thank you for Tucker and the administrative team. for. <laughs> Thanks, Superintendent Tucker and his team as well uh, for their time putting this together. This is a tax cap compliant budget. It is something that has been uh, drafted collaboratively from the building level up through committee level at the board, and then finally with the full board. So this is hit every single tier of the school district along the way. And certainly I'm with great anticipation, uh, expecting great questions. Superintendent Tucker, thanks. Should I put this in view mode? Uh, good evening, folks. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be with you tonight. The last time we presented a budget to you was in May of last year, and it took us 29 minutes. So I'm not gonna make any promises, but my, I know that you have a busy night tonight and our hope is to give you enough information so you can be informed about the budget, but also so that you have time to ask us some questions. And it seems like we're having a little bit of technical challenges in um, the size, but we'll make it work. Um, wanted you to know that I also have with me the chair who introduced us tonight. Uh, we also have the assistant superintendent, Amy Hines, and then someone from our business office, payroll specialist who's on a lot of work on this budget, Diane Clary, and they'll be filling in some information on this as well. Amy, you want to start? Off? Thank you for having me. Um, the our priorities for this budget are focused on to continue work on our instructional and portrait of a graduate goals, and to continue to best support our student, staff, and programs, and to meet them where they are socially, behaviorally, and academically. Superintendent might want to get the mic a little closer to her. Okay. Is that better? Yes, that's great. 
So during the past two years, health and safety protocols have been in place due to COVID. February allowed our protocols to lessen in our schools, but we needed to continue to support our students. We are trending into a better place now, but we still need to meet them where they are as we are moving towards a more normal time in our schools. The pictures here show um, examples of our students and activities running, returning to a look um, more as they did before COVID happened. In that slide, there's a picture of a class trip of our middle school kids going to NHTI so they can experience college. We didn't really do class trips for a couple of years, so it's exciting that we're <laughs> doing those kinds of things. We have a dance here. Um, and we also, looking at the COVID numbers in the school, we have 13 cases of COVID. So at a time when we were talking about COVID cases and quarantine and isolation, we are not really talking about that. At the same time, we know that the effects of COVID are real, and we know that this has been hard on kids, it's been hard on all of us. And so making sure that we're supporting kids where they're at, as well as uh, academically and behaviorally is gonna be an important part of our work. We have a, we talk about a tiered system of report supports. And so for, in order for a child to be ready for learning, they have to be supported emotionally and behaviorally. And so part of this triangle that you see on this slide. Superintendent, might you be able to blow up that image just a little bit? Um, you know what, Glenn? There you go. How's that? There we go. Maybe. Yeah. That, oh, that's, that's terrific. That's really helpful. All right. Sorry about that. No, it's quite all right. Um, great. Is that better? Much better. Okay. So part of our system of supports is about supporting kids behaviorally, and kids need a lot of that support right now. And so making sure that we have systems and our systems in place will be able to do that. Um, we're also using a variety of assessments to monitor kids academically. We have uh, resources and staff members that are teachers in the classroom, but we've talked to the city council in years past about social workers and behavioral specialists who are an important part of our tiered system of supports. So quality instruction is a budget priority and has been a district goal that staff will continue to work on as a focus. Continue, we are going to continue to focus on professional development to improve teaching. We are going to do as much embedded training as we can do in the areas of literacy and math. The district focus pre-K through 12 has been um, and will continue to be on literacy across all content areas and have all students read, discuss, and write in, across the grades. Uh, we will continue on a student-focused learning, um, personalization, voice, and choice for our students. Um, we will continue to work with our mentoring and coaching with staff during the school year. Coaches will continue to come into the buildings and offer support, support to staff and target areas in the area of math and literacy and have coaches continue to come into our buildings. We'll also continue to work with our new staff during the school day and after school to give them the skills that they need to succeed. One of the most exciting parts of our work is the portion of a graduate. And I think back to, I think it was July 31st, 2019, when I first became the superintendent of Laconia. And some of you, I remember Councilor Lippman was there and Mayor Hosmer was there um, to talk about what a portrait of a graduate was and what are the skills that we think are most important for a, for a, a child to know to be successful in school and also to be um, successful afterwards. I think Councilor Felch, you were there as well. Um, and if I've forgotten anybody, please forgive me for that. Um, so we've identified those skills and we have a portrait of a graduate a poster that has those six skills, which include communication, collaboration, creativity, perseverance, problem solving, and self-direction. And so we've done, a, I think, a good job of focusing our teaching and learning experiences in the classroom on that. And we also have uh, community outreach to try to figure out what are the best opportunities for kids in the future? How can we engage the business community in Laconia in the Lakes region so that they know what those opportunities are and we can uh, inspire kids to want to work and be in Laconia in the Lakes region because we know this is a great place to be. So we have a portion of a graduate advisory board that the mayor sits on uh, with me and Principal Brian, who's here with me as well, is on that board. And our goal is to try to connect people with um, career options after or in school, while they're in school, so that they can see what it's like out there. Um, the thought of multiple pathways that when I think about my path in school, it was really you took these classes, you graduated from high school, and then you went to college. And now 
we're working on having a multitude of pathways for kids to careers, different careers and different options. You know that we have the Hewitt Technical Center and that's an amazing um, resource for kids in Laconia. About 50% of all the kids who go to the Hewitt are from Laconia. I think having it right on site is a great value for us. And then also trying to come up with ways to assess kids and the, their work on these skills. Uh, and so we want to continue to do the curriculum work and to have opportunities in the community for our kids to be inspired for careers. This is the, the tax cap compliance side. So as you all know, the CPIU and the building permits uh, are as high as they've ever been. Uh, and so that's a very unique place to be. Um, and so the tax cap calculation uh, gives us an allowable increase of about $1.7 million. Um, in our plan, in our budget, we're looking at having uh, revenues from adequacy, building aid, as well as free and reduced uh, uh, aid that we get. Um, we also plan on having some of that uh, budget uh, supported by trust funds. The Capital Reserve School Construction and Renovation Trust Fund is basically the building and maintenance trust fund. So if we had to tap into that, we would do that. And then also the special ed uh, trust fund, which we'll talk a little bit about special education in the district because that's a moving target. And we have to support kids when they come to us. We need to be ready to do that. And so the total appropriation we're looking for is a 3.7% increase with a total appropriation of $44.6 million. We have uh, categorized the, um, some slides so that you can see the breakdown in terms of the big picture view. Uh, about 75% of all of the budget is, is going towards staff and in the Hampshire schools in Laconia, it's pretty typical that our, our staff uh, in, uh, to support our kids uh, takes that amount of the budget. And so um, just before we get into the, the details of the budget, the increases in the budget are salary. And because of some uh, staffing uh, changes we've made, the salary increases in this budget are not as significant as we thought they would be, especially when you think about a contract that has um, cost the district about $400,000. The benefits have uh, a significant increase, uh, special education, contractor services, utilities. I, I think everybody knows that energy costs are, are going up and we want to plan for that. Uh, contracted services and maintenance, special education, transportation, and new equipment. The decrease, the most significant decrease is because the bond at Pleasant Street School and Elm Street School has been paid off. We will have $300,000 approximately less in payments to make for that bond. Wanted also for you to know that we continue to use COVID money to support our budget. And so that's being used to support instruction, professional development, uh, staff, we have staff that is not a part of this budget that we're hiring with COVID money because the whole purpose of COVID money is to make sure that staff, uh, that we're supporting what's called learning loss. And I'm not really, I don't love that term, but at the same time, that's what it's for. And so having teachers on the ground with kids is an important way to support learning loss. As well as technology and facilities, we've done some amazing work with facilities, as I think a lot, all of you know. Uh, we also plan on supporting uh, technology, one-to-one -one devices, and infrastructure with COVID money. Before we get into the nitty-gritty details, does anybody have any questions or comments for us? Okay. <clears throat> and so, as I said uh, before, the LEA contract. Uh, cost the district about $400,000 in new money. And that includes dental insurance, which we um, talked about the last time I was here in front of city council on April 11th. Um, and we'll talk about the benefits in the next slide. Uh, and so because of uh, an exploratory being reduced at the middle school, uh, because we were able to take a, a position out of the LEA and put it into a contracted services line, um, we've been able, and because of some savings through to retirement. So we have a teacher who's being paid more and retiring, and then we hire a teacher at a, a lesser uh, pay scale. That has uh, helped us to, to make the, the increase of the collective bargaining agreement, the LEA, 0.84% uh, or $91,000. Um, any questions or comments about that slide? Diane, anything to add to that? Um, just that when... Uh... Probably you, have. you have uh, six retirees in the seventy to eighty thousand dollar range, and you uh, we budget for a bachelor step five, which is forty nine thousand. That um, is significant changes, and often a younger teacher 
as a single health plan, but we budget for a two person. So that that's also something that when everything shakes out by the time we have the new hires in, um, the budget should be in good shape. We've um, built in increases for non-union employees, including administration. Um, and we also wanted to highlight the fact that we're looking to add two positions to the elementary schools. So right now you might know, and some of you might remember that we have an art teacher that's moving between Pleasant Street and Elm Street School and the same with a music teacher. This budget includes adding two positions to support exploratories and music, which if you know anything about Laconia and its history in the music program, and I'm looking at Councillor Felch and you're nodding your head um, because of your experience, uh, we have an amazing growth in music. Uh, we have a lot of kids in elementary school who are really um, connecting with school and learning. And there's good research to say that if you're in a music program, you're probably going to do better in school. And so it's another way to engage kids that we're excited about. In the benefit line, uh, health insurance has gone up 11.55%. And so even though the the guaranteed maximum of the increase is only 3.3%. Uh, the overall increase is 11.55%. Diane, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Uh, health insurance is a moving target um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, when we have young teachers that come in that are under 26 and then they turn 26 and they come off their parents, they come on to ours. Um, we also had several babies born last year. So people going from a two person to a family increases by $10,000 um, and from a one person to a two person, uh, another $10,000. So all the changes and the uh, budgeting for a two person when maybe it might only be a single causes the increase. That's called job security. Job right? security, babies are good. <laughs> Do you wanna just stay up here so you don't have to keep getting sure. up and down? <laughs> um, this budget uh, includes dental insurance. So as I said, we have 188 teachers in our LEA collective bargaining agreement, but we're also looking to have uh, dental insurance for non-union employees as well. And we've costed that out as a, about a, as a total of about $200,000. So we don't know exactly who's going to take it and what they're going to take, but in terms of what, we're, what they're taking for health uh, coverage, um, we think that we have a pretty good estimate on what, what, what they would take for health and for dental insurance. One of the driving forces in this budget is the contracted services for special education. We always do our best to try to hire our own employees, um, but the, they are very much a critical shortage area for speech and occupational therapy and physical therapy and school psychologists. So many times we do end up having to go through an agency. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier, we did have due to a couple of retirements, we had a speech pathologist as well as a speech assistant go from the salary line into a contracted service line, which is part of that increase. Um, we do have a change in a school psychologist um, position, which is a change of an agency that increased the budget about 60,000. And then we did have an increase this year of some Bill White behavioral support for meeting some of our students um, where they need where they were to address that behavior. So those are kind of the highlights of some of those additions. So basically all of those uh, things that the assistant superintendent talked about, they're all based on student needs and IEPs. So we have to address those. And that, as we said at the beginning, this is a moving target. And based on where we're at now, this is what we're looking at. And do you want to take the... Uh, so uh, these are our um, contracted services for our buildings. Uh, water and sewer is in this uh, group. Um, we have some old buildings that need some attention quite often through, through the year. So we like to um, foresee what might come up this year. Uh, and increases in uh, gas prices and uh, fees from uh, contractors caused uh, a bit of an increase on that um, to maintain our buildings and keep our kids safe. At the same time, I was uh, reminiscing with Councillor Hamill about the amount of building projects that we've done in the past three years and in the past 20 years. When you think about it, every single building in Laconia School District has had a significant renovation in the past 20 years, as many of you well know. And so, uh, one of the only good things that came out of COVID is that we were able to do some of those projects, like the renovation of the LHS auditorium, like the LHS gymnasium renovation, like the paving at the high school and some of the other schools. So it gave us the opportunity. So uh, this line you can see has changed a lot, 
over time. Um, and that has something to do with that. Um, this, these two lines highlight some of the special education transportation. Um, we have had an increase in our special education transportation costs due to out of district court placement placements, which we are required to transport two day programs in the area, along with the contractual increases of the little buses in, in the district. As we'll discuss in a few minutes, the tuition lines for both um, the public is highlighted, but the tuition line for private, those are always huge driving forces in the special education budget. Um, many of those are um, out of district placements that are court placements that we don't have control over um, and continue to be a driving factor in the budget. How many students do you have in that, do you know? We have 22 out of district placements. Uh, three of those currently are uh, district placements. Um, Diane talked about rising energy costs. And so we built in some increases for the electricity and the propane and natural gas, most of, most of which is natural gas. We have a, a contract for electricity and we were able to lock in a fairly decent rate in November. And <clears throat> was it two contracts? Um, we're in contract with for electricity till 2025. One contract. One contract. One contract for the buildings, right? You can see that the software line has uh, changed pretty significantly too, and again, that has everything to do with the fact that we're able to use unspent revenues from the past and CARES money to pay for software, and by that it means our student information system, uh, a math tutorial we use as Zern, uh, different testing. So. Um, CARES money is able to support that. We're also looking to, to build this up because we know that we can't um, not fund this over the long term. And that goes to the, the same point with new equipment. And so you can see that in 2019 and 2020, we had budgeted $445,000 for new equipment, much of which is uh, overhead boards and interactive boards for um, our teachers and then one-to-one -one devices. And then you can see by 2021-22, it's down to 10% uh, of that cost. And again, the reason is we're able to use ESSER money to support the purchase of one-to-one -one devices when the district went remote back in 2020. Um, we know that that's not gonna happen forever. And we also uh, budgeted for an E-rate project that will increase connectivity and bandwidth in our schools uh, that project is going to cost the district about $146,000. So that proposal for this year, a new equipment, $228,010, $146,000 of that is for this um, E-rate project, which we pay 20% for, and then we get federal money that will pay 80% of that. So that's, even though $146,000 is a pretty significant increase, the fact that we're able to get that much federal reimbursement for that is it makes sense, particularly in this day and age. Superintendent Tucker, I, I saw E-rate come up in, in your budget a couple of times there. Is that the connectivity, the fiber connectivity among, among schools? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, and then the principal and interest, as I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, that $306,711 is a savings from not having to pay that bond payment at Pleasant and Elm. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the out-of-district tuition cost is a huge driving um, force in the, in the special education budget part of our school budget. Um, it does reflect placements both by DCYF, which are abuse and neglect, as well as the um, juvenile justice, which is the delinquency branch involvement. Um, when a student is court involved and they are placed in a placement, if they are a special education student, we're required to pay that educational cost for that student. Um, so as I mentioned before, we have 22 um, current out of district placements, only three of those are district placements, we, where we have determined as a team that we can no longer meet that child's needs, which are usually very medically involved. Um, the school district is required to call what's called a 402 cap. We are responsible to pay up to a certain percentage. Um, the anticipated amount for that for 22-23 is about just under uh, or just over rather 53,000 per student. So that is times that many placements. Um, again, and it's important to remember we don't have control even if the students aren't having any issues with school. We are required to play, pay that if they are identified special education. 
We currently have about 90 students that are court involved. So that has significantly gone down the last couple of years. Um, a few years ago, we saw a huge increase in our out of district placements. In one year, I think it was about 14 or 19 placements that changed and it can swing very quickly. With COVID, we saw a lot of students returning home because the placements needed to close. Um, so we, we saved about, um, I think it was 296,000 last year. We had a decrease in our out of district tuition line. This year, it was originally up about 254,000 from last year. And just since March from our school budget work sessions, we've been able to decrease that about 140,000. So at least it's going in the right direction. Um, but again, it just shows you how much that can change um, in just a few, few months. So we do our best on the students that we know of or that we anticipate, but that's kind of a, a real number in real time. And so in closing, just wanted to remind the council about what our go goals are and they really haven't changed. Obviously the goals are to support students, right? Kids are at the center of what we do and our mission statement is about supporting kids uh, every day and ensuring their success. Um, but we also wanna continue the work on the Portrait of Graduate and quality instruction. And so wanna just, uh, again, thank you for your time today. I know it's been a, you know, it's been a challenging uh, time in COVID. I was reflecting on the past three years and every one of my three years as a superintendent has something to do with COVID. So when we talked about returning to normalcy on that third slide, I'm thinking, okay, we're not in normalcy yet, but at least we're able to meet in person and it's great to be with you in person. Um, hopefully we haven't taken too much of your time. I think we only took about 10 minutes when we presented the teacher contract and I think we're at 31 minutes. And if you have questions for us, we'd love to take them. Good. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Just a, a few questions um, in terms of um, expected laps in the current year. Um, the numbers that we see are against the, the budget. So we don't really have a sense of how expenses are flowing. And if there is going to be a lapse, where would you like to direct it? So uh, lapse in federal and state funding, do you mean? You're basically any funding that you wouldn't spend in the current year that would either um, flow over to um, city fund balance if we didn't agree to put it to a um, a different account or um, that are a carryover because you can hold on to those funds because, for example, your COVID money or your ESSER money or whatever have you. Right. Just trying to get a sense of how the, what the financial picture looks like in the current year we're in and, and what, what you might have to help buttress future reserves. So at this point, we're looking good in terms of this fiscal year, so we don't anticipate any issues. Um, we, if we did um, have any challenges with a lapse in funding next year? I'm talking about a lapse where you would re would spend less than what you had um, been authorized to because spending it isn't as much as you anticipated. So therefore there's money to carry forward to a future period. Right. So um, where would we take that from? Is that what you're asking? Um, I'm asking, do you have a feel for the, and you can take this question back if you're not ready for it tonight. Sure. But, um, it's what amount of money, um, if you were budgeted for 30 million and you're gonna spend 29.5 million, where are, are you gonna spend right up to 30? The question is, in the current year, do you have funds that you expect not to have to expend because of other, for very various reasons, could be, as you said, the, the example where you had some savings because people came back in district. I'm sure that didn't happen this year, but um, things like that. Yeah, so we would um, look into tapping into the trust if we have to. Um, we would look into tapping into the probably the building maintenance trust or the special education trust. We built that in if we had to do that. Um, that would that would be our plan. I guess what I'm asking for, and maybe you can work with the with the school district on on that perspective, kind of show them how we sort of look at labs. Um, if I could have, please. Um, in terms of um, talked about the significant investments in um, technology and, and plant and the like, um, and I think you partially answered this question for me offline. Um, in terms of uh, the budget is lighter than than in prior years, but what how much funds are we holding in future expenditures, like from either COVID money or? Uh, other sources that we look to spend in future years. Uh, I think one of our concerns, it's always good to 
to renovate and make things look better. It's, it's sustaining, whether it be the technology or the plant investment. And that's sort of my second question. Yeah, so um, right now we're looking at doing a facilities project at Laconia High School with ESSER three funds. We actually just had a meeting with uh, Marinus Architects earlier today. And that project, uh, we've allocated uh, about $6 million for that project. And that project would allow us to do some significant renovations in the kitchen area at the high school, the locker room area, um, the old plumbing and heating room where Jerry Murphy used to teach plumbing and heating back before the renovation, um, as well as some bathrooms. And so that's one way that we can um, alleviate pressure from the, from the budget. Uh, we also have spent about, um, we, we've left over about a million dollars in technology from ESSER that we would use and that would continue to support our one-to-one -one devices for kids, iPads, interactive boards. We also have some money allocated for ESSER staff. And so we wanna continue to hire staff because I, we feel like it's not gonna be just one year and then that's it. Uh, we feel like the impact of COVID on kids and, and the impact on their learning is something that we need to continue to think about. And so right now we have money allocated for staff as well. So I guess just another sort of follow-up, just trying to get a, a sense of not arguing against the current budget, but just what the, what the total spend really looks like in terms of what's going on, because we're only getting a partial look at what's going on as a function of what's ordinarily in our, our accounts here, but like we're not seeing the, the rest of the picture. I'd just like to get a feel for that. Not that it would affect how I look at other items. I just want to know. Um, Council Littman, are you looking for just an update on the ESSER and what we have and what we spent? I'm trying to get a total picture of what, we're, what school spending is going on in the current years, kind of the, the perspective and what might be outside of what is in the the presentation here today that you would be able to undertake. And I'm not questioning any of it. I just want sure. to understand. Um, and then um, just get two more questions. Um, in terms of the special ed and out of district placements in terms of DCYF and Medicaid funding and transportation funding under Medicaid, do we feel like we're taking full advantage of those opportunities to offset our costs? Mm -hmm. Yep, we have. We have seen a decrease um, in our Medicaid reimbursement the last few years because of COVID um, in our shortage to hire paraeducators or rehab assistants. Um, so that has had kind of a significant um, effect on what we can bill for sessions. Um, but anything that we are billing that matches the IEPs, absolutely, that includes the transportation. Great. And um... I guess my other question is incorporated in my last ask, so I'll turn it over to anybody else who has any questions. Any other questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll go right ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just curious, what is what is the present uh, student to teacher ratio at the school? It depends. I mean, we you'd have to look at um, by school and by grade level. So right now. Allison, not to put you on the spot, but the middle school, we were looking at a budget where we're looking at some staffing models and it looked like we had uh, 17 to 18 students per classroom in the middle school. Um, I, I would say most of our classes are 20 and under. There are some classes at the high school that might be more than that and then some that are less than that, but we've been able to keep class sizes very reasonable okay and what is the population of the total schools you have an idea how many students we have uh, about 1830 students at this point okay, so not too long ago it's about 2000 isn't it yeah so for the past uh five or six years our numbers were treading trending in the 1900s just below and so we're slightly below that now um okay um the um remote learning that uh, they had to go through during the <laughs> pandemic and all that. I like how you said that they had to go through it. Yeah. It seemed like it wasn't a pleasant experience. <laughs> probably, probably wasn't. Right. <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what do you have an idea of what the average effect was on a student? I mean, uh, the learning process obviously was difficult because my grandson had a really difficult time with that. Yeah. Um, so do you have an idea of... Uh, <coughs> 
the grade level that, I mean, did they accomplish the grade level that they needed to be at or are they having to extra study and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think we're still trying to wrestle with that. We've seen some areas of improvement. So looking at some of the, the math and the reading benchmarks in elementary school, we, we've seen some grade levels where 70% or more kids are making progress or adequate progress on a reading um, assessment and a math assessment. And then we're seeing some areas where we need to do some work. You know, when you, when you talk about the impact of remote learning, I remember um, the hybrid schedule and the three months of remote and coming home after, you know, the three months that we were in remote learning for the whole and having three kids, you know, sitting on their computers and just thinking to myself, wow, this is just not how learning is supposed to go. And it's not that VLAX and some of those other online, online learning platforms aren't helpful, but I think we as a city and as a school district really believe that face-to-face in-person learning is what, what benefits kids. There's so much to be learned from other kids and those experiences. So to, to answer your question, I think we're still trying to, to, to deal with that. We're still trying to understand that. We have some work to do. There's definitely some areas where um, we're looking to support kids more. Okay. Um, so a, a student graduating in 12th grade, um, when they graduate, are they at a level of, of, of a 12th grader? Well, I think that's a hard question because um, there are some kids who are going to go in the military. And what determines if they're ready is that they pass the ASVAB test. If you have a kid who's going to one of the most elite universities in the, in the world or in the country, they have to do well in a certain standardized assessment, the SAT. And in some cases, they don't even have to do well in the SAT because the SAT is not being used as much to determine progress. So I think our goal is to have multiple measures of, of looking at how kids are doing and not just one. So I think it depends on the assessment. It depends on when they take it. It depends on we have some that are, are issued by teachers, and then we have some that are issued by the state of New Hampshire, and then some by the college board. So I think it depends on... So it's something that's hard to judge. It is. Yeah. It is. Because nationally, uh, whether you believe the statistics of one person over the other, they say an average student in the 12th grade has an 8th eight, grade education. Yeah. I wonder what that means. Like I, I, no I wonder how you measure that. But that's a... That's interesting. Yeah. Know, do you have a thought about that? No, I think it is. I think it's hard because I think it's all over the place. Yeah. And I yeah. think it just depends, like you said, on, on the different criteria of, of their next step of what that looks like. Okay. So uh, during the COVID time where students were remote learning, um, did you find any savings or was it more expensive uh, during that time period for the school? In terms of the cost of education? Uh, well, I love how you talked about COVID in the past tense. That was great <laughs> to hear that. Um, yeah, I'm done with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're alone. Um, I think when, you, when we had to uh, create a remote division where 21% of our kids in the fall of 2020 were in a remote division, uh, we had to pay teachers. That cost something. We were able like to use school. It was essentially a whole other school with 407 kids mm -hmm. in it. Uh, we had to equip, make sure every kid had a device that costs mm -hmm. money. So fortunately, we've been able to monopolize on those COVID funds to support that, um, which has allowed us to use funding in the school budget for other things, too. OK, um, and I'm going to kind of piggyback on what uh, Council Lippman said uh, as far as, you know, like, like the total budget. I mean, if we could see all the COVID money or whatever state some whatever government money has come into the school sure it would be nice to see what that total is because i mean you just threw out six million dollars for, for that project uh, at the high school some re more repairs at the high school right is that in here no okay it is not. so if we could kind of see what the full amount is sure that would be really great to, to see that what we spent and what we are planning to spend yeah what you've already spent from uh, federal government money and there's more for next year than that too, you know, if it's pertaining to this, but I'd like to see what happened last year too, in, in their present budget now, Yeah. Uh, to see what expenditures, I mean, what funding you had for teachers, for whatever. Right. We tried to really separate that. I, I, I didn't want to confuse anybody, but wanted to acknowledge the fact that we were receiving COVID yeah. money. 
but maybe it could be a separate piece of paper sure. than, than this so we could actually see the figures. Happy to do that. Okay. Um, and my last comment is I'm, I'm very, um, very glad of your budget and the team that put it together. Um, I'm glad to see that you are investing in the school still, which is my big thing. I, I want to see the schools stay, stay good. Right. Um, and uh, I like the idea of you looking to, to, to um, look at different channels of learning. Not every kid has to go to college. Right. You need plumbers, you need electricians, and try and get one. Right. You know, it's $100 a, a for an hour just to knock on your door. <laughs> so they can do well in that yeah. stuff. And I'd like to see the Hewitt Center kept up to date. You know, in, if the mechanical um, uh, part of the school there, the MCI machinery or whatever they call it, I forget now. Uh, needs to be updated, you know, we should do that. And we should ask the state to help with that because the state helped at one point. Yes, they did. Uh, when they were giving money for uh, technical training in schools. We were the last one to get it, I believe. Yeah. Under the wire. So right. it was good that we did that. Uh, so thanks again. And I thank you personally, Mr. Tucker. Yeah, thank you, sir. Appreciate um, your, your time. And um, we'll get you that information um, so you can get a sense of what COVID spending. And remember that we also, in the fall of 2019, received some stabilization money. And that was from the governor's budget that was signed in October of 2019. So we could show you some things that we did. We, we can show you how we spent that money as well. And it went from everything to uh, a new uh, cooking uh, equipment at Woodland Heights that was 50 years old to the facilities projects mm -hmm. at the high school. So happy to do that. It's a good investment. Absolutely. We're right ahead, Council Lippman. Just following up on Council Hamill's Hewitt um, Center, I mean, I think one of the things that led to it being so successful, at least at the start, was that everything was up to date equipment wise. What's, what's the investment that's happening at the Hewitt Center um, in terms of particularly advanced manufacturing? That was, I think that program went like from two to 50 kids or some, some large percentage change. And, what are we what are we doing in this budget um, or with uh, COVID or other sources of federal funds to to keep uh, the Hewitt Center technologically where it needs to be? Yeah, I think it's um, it feels like when I think about keeping an update, I think about the media center, uh, media center arts that Ray Sleeper teaches. And when you walk into that studio, I don't know when the last time you've been in that studio, but it's a state of the art studio. And is it called the green room, something yeah. like that, where at the beginning of this COVID, I would do um, press releases from there and video announcements. So, uh, and then I think about advanced manufacturing. When you talk about the state, I also think about New Hampshire ball bearing, and Gary Grolo and the work that some of you on the council did to make sure that that was something that was upgraded. So we have a Perkins grant that um, funds a lot of the Hewitt. It's a grant that is about, Diane, 185, $190,000 a year. Every year, yeah. And, uh, the, the Hewitt director has done a great job of using that grant to support program. Uh, I don't know when the last time equipment in those two classes were up, uh, updated, but I could get you that information. And I feel like we're sending kids into uh, manufacturing careers who have opportunities as soon as they get out of high school or they can go to college. And so it how's, feels like we're doing that, but I don't, I can get you that information. Is, how's enrollment in that program? That, that was an indicator when we fell behind on equipment, the enrollment was like single digits. What's enrollment look like? Overall in the Hewitt, uh, enrollment for next year looks really good. Yeah, and, and advanced manufacturing in particular is, is I guess my question. Don't know exactly. I, I know that the, I do know that the numbers are uh, stable and solid, but I, I can get you that information. It used to be a waiting line. Right. Travel. Mr. Martin's done a really good job of um, trying to appeal to younger uh, kids and getting freshmen and sophomore in the programs. We're also looking at creating an exploratory for sophomores where they were in the first block when the teachers have that off, having uh, when the kids aren't in the classes, going into those classes and having experiences to, to whet their appetite for you. But I can get you that information. I, I know we have a law enforcement component in there. Do we have anything in the fire? Uh, service area and I know we have nursing or L LNA program just thinking about the the jobs that are unfilled or to be <laughs> coming vacant in the city here I think uh, e EMS is one of the areas that uh, there's a, a major shortage that 
um, is affecting not just uh, Laconia, but the whole state? We've done a lot to support program at the, at the Hewitt. So um, we bought, we're offering an EMS class this semester and we're looking to do it for the full year of semester one and semester two class. Um, we've had uh, some challenges um, in trying to do a fire safety course just because it's been hard to, to find people to do it. Um, we've had some good conversations with chiefs around the, the area to do that. You probably know that LRCC has one of the most elite fire safety programs in the region, if not the country. And so to be able to support that would be great. I think the EMS program will do that. Um, we continue to offer law enforcement. And I know we have a lot of kids who are really excited about being in that program. We actually added a, an assistant to support uh, the plumbing and heating and the building trades class because the numbers are getting so big that we felt that we need to have another person in there to support. So we have this uh, great person I just saw on Friday is Bob Solemne, and he's uh, working with our kids in those two classes and having a great experience. Um, so I, I feel I, I'm really excited about what we're doing in the Hewitt and what we're trying to do. Is the uh, house almost built? Uh, I saw it. I, I saw it from the outside, but I really don't know what it's looked like in terms of the wiring and the plumbing and heating. So, so that's that's something. I, 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 you don't have an electrical course over there, right? We do it in night school, so we have a lot of people coming and taking night courses. Should, and uh, should look at that. Because... Yeah, I think I I would love to do that. Um, the the question is who's going to teach it. That's what we. We, we need people that are in the trades who want to come back and give a little bit. And we have people doing that. But yeah, there's a growing need for electricians. I'm hearing that from some of my friends in that industry. Uh, Superintendent, Superintendent Tucker, uh, Assistant Superintendent um, Hines, uh, thank you very much uh, for this presentation tonight. And uh, uh, Superintendent, you're right, three years ago, you were hit the job, hit the ground running and and the world changed um, dramatically. So thank you for your leadership and your commitment to education in this city. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And, and I will say it's uh, an eye-opening and really rewarding to be part of Portrait of a Graduate and to listen to students participate and how they speak up and how articulate and insightful they are. Um, how confident they are in a room full of adults. They speak right up and they share their opinions. Um, I really think it's uh, indicative of the quality work that's going on in our schools. And I just wanted to say thank you. Diane, thank you for your work. Uh, Dr. Bryant, um, thank you for yours. And, and Chair Hayward, thank you for your work on the school board. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank, thank you, counselors. Thank you, city manager. Appreciate it. Hmm? Oh, why don't we adjourn the meeting at 6.53 p.m.? <laughs>